Welcome to Day 16 Spiritual Practice from Sir John Templeton. Um, today, his, the practice is a direct quote, can be stated in a direct quote from Sir John Templeton. Look for God in a multitude of ways. Look for God in a multitude of ways. Now, you can substitute for the word God any other uh, divine uh, uh, name that you prefer or even something more ge general such as being or the absolute or reality, what ultimately is, as you like. Um, so, uh, as, he, as he writes, look for that in a multitude of ways. So, I'd like to begin with a, with a kind of a practical exercise. Maybe wherever you are, uh, you might like to think of two or three ways in which uh, you uh, look or seek or interact with what is ultimate for you in, in your context. Uh, to look, what are the three different ways in which you relate uh, to the divine? Uh, take a moment and note them somehow, somewhere for your own use in the future, perhaps as part of the discussion. Now take a moment to do that. And uh, I, of course, can think of at least three. Maybe you think of at least three or more. So uh, while you're doing that, uh, or if you like, you can come back to that activity later. Let me just suggest to you uh, some of a very long list of ways of looking for the divine or relating to the divine that have been developed in the world's religious traditions. Prayer, but what is prayer? Uh, I'll have more to say about that uh, perhaps tomorrow. Prayer, meditation, and contemplation, similar but different activities. How about yoga? Yoga is so diverse. Uh, and can give a whole lecture series on that, Tai Chi. But what Tai Chi and yoga have in common is that they're not just mental or inward pro pro practices, they're also physical practices as well. Um, participating in rituals, religious rituals, this is central to virtually all religious traditions. And you may think, oh, I'm not, I don't have a religious ritual in my tradition. Well, if there's anything that you do in your religious tradition in a repetitive way, even if it's just the way that you enter the building, sit down and hear someone talk, that's a ritual. It's a very simple ritual, but it is a way of marking a distinction between the everyday working world, the world of everyday life, and that sacred dimension where even in the most basic of, of environments, even if it's just a big, uh, a big auditorium with no ornamentation, that small, tiny ritual is enough to set that off as sacred space. Um, their rituals have many names and many traditions, pujas, celebrations, sacraments, liturgies, listening to religious or spiritual discourses, listening to me talk, listening to a sermon. These days, perhaps more likely going, uh, getting a, uh, going online and listening to a podcast or looking at a YouTube video of a spiritual figure. The whole, every religious tradition in the world these days is available to us through, uh, through the internet. Um, Immersion in nature, taking long walks, hiking, going on, uh, on, on long pilgrimages into nature, silence, solitude, fasting, mindfulness meditation, deep, insightful, reflective thinking about the meaning of a scriptural text, um, charitable giving, giving of one substance to those in need, helping to build up institutions of which we're a part as a volunteer, service to the world, whether publicly in the name of your religion or not, but giving back to the world with, as a way of repaying with gratitude the gifts, the gift of life that's been given to us. And then, as I suggested before, uh, learning the language uh, of spirituality that allows us to see the moon as teaching us, as a kind of natural revelation, teaching us uh, something about the nature of, of our, our lives seen from the standpoint of the divine. And the changes or the phases in the moon actually very graphically reveal to us the truth that what appears to be death is always followed by a rebirth. And that's, of course, an idea that's central to Christianity, but it's an idea, this notion of, of death leading into life is actually the founding metaphor, the fundamental natural revelation that gives rise to religion. Religion, remember, not as just a social institution, but religion slash spirituality as that only dimension 
that only form of human learning that speaks to us with utmost confidence about the meaning of life and life after death. Um, so, uh, for instance, if you, uh, if you want to, to know if our lives have ultimate meaning, you don't usually take a course in biology as important as biology is, or even mathematics or statistics, um, and you probably wouldn't go ask uh, in, in, in a, an electronics store the person there, what is the deep meaning of life, what, how can this electronics store help me? No, what we do is... We turn to religious sources generally or spiritual sources. We may turn to the great philosophers and we may also turn to the arts because our aesthetic intuitions as well as our, our ethical values, these all also point us towards something immaterial. But that institution in human life that most reliably for human beings over the millennia has pointed us towards this comprehensive spiritual solution to the questions in life has invariably, invariably been the human religious traditions. So those are some of the ways uh, in which you may relate to the divine, and you hopefully will have added to that list, and it would be great to hear uh, what some of those additions are. Um, so uh, that, was a, that was the setup for the practice. This is not a, uh, necessarily a sitting down under the Bodhi tree type meditation. This is more of an active, reflective kind of meditation. But as you'll notice, you may notice something. Any kind of reflective activity, if pursued with, uh, with some diligence, will turn out to be a concentration practice. And a concentrated mind becomes still, and the still mind is able to... Uh, observe without judgment the way things are, and finally, as a consequence of that non-judging observing, to resume our natural identity with the fundamental oneness out of which everything arises. So, the practice. Perhaps on your list, uh, you've noted various ways that you relate to the divine. See if you cannot come up with a completely novel way of connecting your awareness with the divine. Can you imagine a, a way of connecting that perhaps someone else has thought of it, but was, is new to you? Maybe it's new to everyone else as well. Um, I, I, I've had some discoveries like this over the years, and what I discovered, or at least I, I rediscovered for myself, is that years ago I, uh, I, I started to notice that when I would go into a museum, uh, and I would stand in front of a, a painting, a picture, uh, that would deeply move me. I would find that instead of rushing from one image to the next, that often I, I just like to stand in front of one or two images, one, one or two paintings, and to contemplate its meaning. I, I would look at the, at the image, and, and at first it would be a lot of intellectual activity, trying to understand the artist's intention and uh, the way the, the materials were used to convey the imagery. But what would slowly happen as I stood there cogitating like that is that, because it's almost always a, an extraordinarily beautiful or significant uh, a, a painting that I'm looking at, is that my mind would start to become still, that all of that mental chatter would start to slow down, and I would begin to experience a, a kind of presence uh, coming out from the painting itself. Uh, its, its, its deeper spiritual meaning would begin to, ex to uh, intrude upon my chattering mind and still it. And, so, and then after a few more minutes of that, I would find that my mind would become absolutely still as I stood contemplating uh, the canvas in front of me. And then that would often intensify to the point where I would begin to experience this kind of inner brightness and this kind of happiness and this bliss. And at that point, I didn't even need the painting any longer. I would often look for a place to sit and to just revel in this, uh, in this mood of transcend transcendent exaltation. And at moments like that, phrases like, I was saved through art would make sense to me. I would understand how a great artist might think that salvation, the overcoming of the fragmentation of life, lay through the, the creating and the contemplation of great art. 
And so for years I thought that that had something to do essentially with going to museums and looking at paintings on the wall. But as time went on, I noticed that I often had this kind of samadhi experience, deep concentration experience, in meditation as well, or at other times. And it turns out that whenever the mind is unified by some external object and we attend to that, that unification of the mind stills it. I'll have more to say about that in the next lecture. And that stilled mind then becomes receptive to the deeper spiritual impulses that are always there underneath the surface but obscured by our busy, chattery, talky minds.